This week on the Eldritch Lawcast, we discuss critical roles, extended universe, and whether Vecna is in the near future of D&D 5e. All that and more right now. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one edition of D&D podcasts. That's right. I'm here. My name is Ben Byrne, and here, as always, with Sean Merwin, James Hake, Dale Kingsmill. And, Dale, I have to ask, this week's opening question is an email from Victoria who asks, quite simply, why are dragons so great? Oh, I mean, come on. It's a dinosaur with big bat wings and it breathes fire. What what, what could you possibly? I Dinosaurs. feel like it speaks for itself. So it's like a pterodactyl that breathes fire is basically no, what you. No, 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 no. I said a dinosaur with bat wings. That's different. Okay. The pterodactyls have pterodactyl wings. Fair enough. Um, yes. uh, James Haik, what about you? Why are dragons uh, so amazing? I'm an enormous dragon fanboy. If I could show you the plethora of dragon minis up on top of uh, my shelf, I would. Um, well, here, here's the thing. There's a lot of very logical, sensible, storytellery reasons why dragons are great. But the thing is, if you don't think they're just the coolest thing as a baseline, no amount of explaining is going to get to you. <laughs> I think dragons are just so damn cool and 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 everything on top of that is just intellectualizing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry victoria if you don't like them already it's just nothing we say is going to change that unless sean merwin you just wrote a campaign setting kind of centered around dragons why are dragons so great well let me tell you uh as i push up my glasses <laughs> they are both intelligent and powerful they are both mundane and magical they, when ancient map makers wrote things about what was lurking off the edges of the map, they did not write here be trolls. They did not write here be giants. <laughs> they did not write here be devils. They wrote here be dragons. And I think that pretty much sums it up. I think that's pretty fair. Man, people from the past were metal. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the map edge that yeah. says here be oozes. <laughs> Can we get that? Uh, you don't want to go off that map here edge. That map edge is. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, yeah. No, dragons are just, uh, dragons are just awesome. I love the, um, they, they do separate themselves in, as you were saying, Sean, their intelligence, um, the fact that they are both kind of bestial and uh, aggressive, but also they are um, incredibly smart. They're a, 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 a massive fight that you can have, but also a massive intellectual conundrum. So yeah, you can kind of play wits. them either Gotta way. Deal yeah. With riddles, yeah. Exactly. Um, but I have a theory that in modern times, dragons kind of represent an anxiety around like mass destruction, this idea of like something you cannot uh, possibly overcome because Game of Thrones has shown us just how useless a man with a sword is against a dragon. Um, you need a you need a, a big archery thing. What are they called? Um, a, a ballista. Big a ballista. Archery thing? <laughs> yeah, big a archery ballista. thing. Uh, no, going with big archery thing. That's uh, what I'm calling them you know from now on the archery thing that requires five men to archer <laughs> yeah exactly the yeah. the five man bow not even, a bow. <laughs> not even a bow an archery thing at least i didn't go with a giant crossbow um as i have been known to do in the past anyway um, kicking off this week's episode, we have a little bit of news uh, that I grabbed from online, which I thought may excite uh, Dale and James, I'm not sure, um, which is the uh, Nine Eyes of Lucian, which is a critical role novel focused on the villain from Campaign 2. I believe this was the, the ultimate villain at the end. I didn't watch a lot of Campaign 2, so please enlighten me. Dale, are you excited for this book? I'm pretty hyped about it. Um, I, I think that it's a, a cool idea to start branching into uh, novels. They've already had the comics for a long time, so it makes sense as a narrative step. And I think that Lucian is a cool character to center it around. Um, yeah. And there's like, there's a lot of 
you know, sort of untold regions in that story that uh, I think leaves room for for exciting, cool stuff. A lot of spaces kind of between uh, sessions in the campaign, so to speak, or like, you know, places they touch on. I believe, uh, am I correct in saying that Marquette was somewhere that they visited in campaign one, but it was sort of like dip the toe in and then leave, dip the toe back in and kind of leave. And it wasn't until the current campaign, season three, that... um, uh, they've kind of really focused the campaign there. Again, I'm just you can tell I'm kind of like fumbling around uh, for for critical role facts because I, I I you know have only kept up with it uh, in the periphery over the last couple of years. But You're the reason really I'm kind well. of yeah, thank you. The reason I'm sort of interested in this is um, there's something about the history of Critical Role, and I mean the in-world history, the the um, story of Vox Machina, the Mighty Nine. And now Bell's Hells, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that just f- there's a real epicness to the storytelling, to the feeling of like the the chroma con cap chroma con Dale, the chroma conclave. Thank you. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> um, add it, a, add it to the warm-up tongue twisters. <laughs> um, a really epic feeling to uh, the first uh, encounter with the Briarwoods, which eventually kind of evolved into the the ultimate confrontation with Vecna um, in campaign one. And now I'm only just learning about Lucian as a character and there is an epicness, this idea of um, kind of body swapping um, with uh, Molly Mock Tea Leaf. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, is... Are these novels, are the graphic novels, I know they've done the origin series with the origins of Vox Machina and I believe they've got a couple for the Mighty Nine as well. Are they good entry points for people that didn't see um, the campaigns? Are they good entry points for people who maybe saw uh, the legends of Vox Machina and kind of want to know more uh, about what that world is like? Um, the graphic novels are great. Vox Machina Origins are the only ones that I've read, but uh, they're they're fantastic. Um, and the reason why they're so great, uh, I think, is because they tackle unseen territory. Legend of Vox Machina is really good, too, in the way that it, you know, uh, streamlines and adapts stuff from the stream. But Legends of Vox Machina is is kind of perfect because you're right. It's it's a gateway to critical role, but it's also stuff that the the, the that super fans have never seen before. And that's the way that I feel about the, I think it's two critical role novels that exist. This this Nine Eyes one that you're talking about, what's the story of, of, of Lucian and the Tomb Takers uh, before uh, they meet up with the Mighty Nine in, in the final sort of driving arc of that campaign. And likewise, Kith and Kin, which is the Vex and Vax origin I story I forgot novel. about Kith and Kin. Well, I've read amazing <gasps> things about it. I haven't read it. The, the author is a really well-known uh, fantasy author. She's great. I've heard amazing things about the book. And it, this whole paradigm of critical role novels is fascinating to me from a from a you know a real life perspective, because the closest like the closest parallel I can think of is like Star Trek novels, which take the adventures of you know Kirk or Picard or Cisco or Janeway or you know your captain of choice and kind of like well here's what if we did an episode of Star Trek but we didn't film it and we you know wrote it as a novel instead of a script and i've always had a, a sort of dim view of those novels because i'm like uh, why didn't they just make an episode but here similar to i guess like the the really top of the line Star Wars expanded universe novels. It's like, okay, we have a story to tell, a new story to tell that we haven't been able to explore in film or any other medium before. Uh, here, you know, we chose to do it in a novel form for a particular reason. And I I want to see what that reason is. Why not do animated series? Why not do live play? Why not do podcasts? Why not do anything else novel? And it's interesting that you bring up the idea of like, um, I don't know what you call them, right? Because there's novelizations which take a, a, you know, film or television piece and just make a book out of it. And -hmm. then you've got these ones that exist within that world, but they're like pseudo canon, right? Mm -hmm. So like my my equivalent of these Star Trek novels is, um, you know, the Buffy books, you know, it's like, we've got Buffy the Vampire Slayer and then here are some books that kind of exist within the same world, but are they canon? Probably not. And they'll, they'll make claims like, you know, oh, 
this is okay. This is inside baseball, but I'm saying it anyway. But like, you know, they'll be like, oh yeah, Faith Lahane was identified by the Watchers Council ahead of time and they and was trained since she was a child. It's like, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense with the television <laughs> show that says these things. Um, so I, there is that that same kind of feeling I get in in my heart that's like, this isn't real. This isn't actually canon. This is and I look down on it a little bit. Not not the not the book itself necessarily, but the existence of that kind of medium where it's like forcing something that I love to be something else. Um, but I don't get that feeling with Critical Role and I do wonder why. And part of it might be that there's a, a specific canon in place when you watch something like a TV show. With something like an actual play, there is all this room for stuff that didn't happen. It didn't happen to happen. And so like there are these gaps that you can you can imagine into. And so it doesn't feel like it's encroaching on canon per se. And I don't think I have as strong a concept of canon when it comes to actual plays. I don't know. This is interesting. Hmm. I think there's also a level of um, critical role is still largely controlled, so to speak, by critical role, right? Like they go out and they find talented people to write um, these novels and write these uh, adventures, uh, you might say, um, and write these, <coughs> James, um, and write these, you know, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Tertiary, uh, you know, media supplements to the, the the main game itself, but they're still fairly centralised uh, around the actual play and around that core team of, of D&D role players. And it hasn't quite had, what this actually reminds me of is the comic book industry. It hasn't had that comic book huh. thing where... You know, it's got decades and decades of, of um, you know, history behind it yet. It hasn't been touched by, you know, tens if not hundreds of writers over the decades that have their own ideas about what these characters are like and change the canon for their particular um, sensibilities. Um, and so it doesn't require, you know, it doesn't have as many contradictions in the, in the law or the canon and also doesn't require a reset yet. But the other way that this reminds me of comic books is in the way that um, took the observation that, you know, the MCU has been around for more than 10 years now, um, like 12, 14 years, something like that. And the comic books have continued to release and there are movies and TV series that are being made now that were comic books after the start of the MCU, right? We think of the the MCU is reaching far back into the the back history of comics and bringing back these um, classical stories. But the the theory being put forward is that the comic books are now proving grounds for what will get turned into movies. They kind of test characters, see if they're popular in the comic books, and then if they, you know, do well enough, if they sell enough copies, they're like, great, let's spin this out into a movie, a TV show, whatever it, it happens to be. And I kind of wonder if Critical Role is, is in that space now where they get to try things and test things in the actual play and then pick the best parts or the parts that kind of strike a chord with the community and spin those out into books, comic books, um, TV shows, you know, whatever it happens to be. Is there a way to say probably in a way that isn't like cynical? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't think there's... <laughs> the, the thing about Critical Role is that when when they bring people on to do their, you know, to do their tertiary products, their books and comic books and stuff like that, I mean, speaking as one of them, uh, the the minds behind Critical Role, they're not just, you know, farming out content to someone who has a good resume or a good community connection. They're generally people who these uh, these creative people already have a good relationship with and, and trust to get the job done. I mean, Matt kept bringing me on for RPG books because kind of by circumstance, we worked on an RPG book together once when Critical Role was little. And, you know, and I didn't disappear into the shadows after that. I kept I kept doing stuff. Um, he works with, uh, shoot, what's her name? Uh, Jody... Jody Hauser, I think, the the comic writer, because they, you know, they they met in in LA and they had, you know, they had professional connections together. They're not just like and 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 they're pals, right? Matt and I have hung out. He and and Jody have hung out. And moreover, the cast of Critical Role are still in leading positions in the company. Uh Travis is the CEO, et cetera, et cetera. So when they have a story to tell, uh there, there's a personal investment as well, instead of just a sort of business investment, which is how you get these very sort of cynical feeling deals. Like, you know, Stan Lee has passed. Uh, 
Uh, Stan Lee is not calling the creative shots of Marvel anymore. It's well, I, I, I hardly hazard hazard a guess. Kevin Feige, I guess, but there's so many layers of of Disney business obfuscation that's going on in the creative process there. I don't. I, I feel sort of cynical when it comes to why they're doing what they're doing. I don't feel that cynicism with Critical Role. Sure, that's fair enough. And and I don't mean to make the comparison in a cynical way of like Critical Role are turning into a, <laughs> a business because you can see that they're just trying things, you know. Like I haven't been keeping up with the latest um, kind of actual play miniseries that they're doing with Brennan uh, DMing and, and diving way it's back great. into the past. <laughs> it's so um, good. <laughs> What what about like how how is that different? I'm curious to know because um, Brennan obviously is very famous for for Dimension Twenty and the kind of madcap style D and D that that tends to be, or at least the impression from from what I've seen of it. How does his uh, style kind of translate into uh, a critical role actual play? What are you enjoying about it, James? There is there are two aspects to it, and one of which is the lore nerd aspect. The calamity is just such a very rich place to to mine the critical role lore and to add complexity to its story uh up until now it's been a very black and white narrative and like that's narrative that, that i've run with because that's the narrative we recall uh in the modern history of exandria but there's there's some very critical role ish shades of gray being sort of painted into the landscape. Now that we're actually seeing it firsthand, we're not rewriting history, but we're adding nuance to it. And I think that's very fun. Uh, second of all, Brennan, the DM and Lou, one of the players adds some of that dimension 20 texture to the show. And, uh, uh, Dimension 20 is incredible. Fantasy High is uh, literally one of my favorite D&D actual plays ever. Like it's up there with Critical Role Campaign 1, with uh, Taz Balance, with, uh, well, with those two. Um, <laughs> and, and they're just so good together and they're so good at bringing the cast together and kind of bringing up both the drama and the silliness in a way that feels quintessentially D&D to me. Uh, I can't explain the je ne sais quoi any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, there's um there's a quality to it that is very old school, like Aristotelian tragedy, right? Mm. Because we know that this isn't going to end well. So we get to see this like, I mean- Apology. This is just f for you who who haven't seen any of it. You know, you start out with this very high tech. Well, we're dealing with basically an apocalypse, right? So you end up with this very like high level, high magic. Um, you know glorious place uh, and you know that there's a fall coming you know that it's coming that's one of the quintessential tragic elements is that it has to uh, contain a reversal of fortune is what Aristotle said and then you've got you know this um evoking through pity and fear you know the purging of of these negative emotions right you you want to what you know that the tragic end is coming but you still want to watch it you still want to see how it happens and it just it adds this this beautiful like like James was saying this depth to the whole scenario and um a key thing for Greek tragic theater that that I've always been interested in is this idea that it's um, telling the story of what would have happened. So it's not it's not necessarily laying down in absolute concrete like stone. This is the absolute truth of the story. It's saying, hey, remember that story of the calamity? This is like what might have happened in that uh, situation, which I find it, it all feels very sort of arty and um, flowy to me in a way that I like. So it's just like the Star Wars prequels is what you're telling just, me. Just like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's a good way to think of the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Greek tragedies. Um, uh, cool. Well, uh, where am I? The nine of eyes of, ben. sorry, ben, the nine eyes of Lucian. Yes, I know. It's very ben, cold here remember? and raining. I'm still half asleep. That's why. It's 2022, um, Ben. Help me. Um, <laughs> we're a little silly today. Ah, <laughs> uh, we're a little silly every week. Let's, uh, let's not yeah. give ourselves any credit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Nine Eyes of Lucian uh, is coming out later this year. It's by Madeline Rue. I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, name correctly. Mm, uh, is mm -hmm. the author behind it. Um, uh, so 
check it out, especially if you're a Critical Role fan and if you're not a Critical Role fan, because as I mentioned, I'm kind of tempted to dive in and use this as my entry into that story or, you know, the graphic novels and, and novels in, in general. Um, this week we had a question come in from Derek. Uh, Derek talking about uh, the giant unearthed arcana, what that may bode um, for the future of giants in the Forgotten Realms and D&D at large, and additionally touching on how Volo's Guide to Monsters is... Um, I don't know. It's kind of unclear to me whether, like, if Wizards said that Volo's Guide to Monsters is, like, no longer canon in terms of the lore that's that's inside that book still. Um, yeah, we've brought up canon in a and d podcast. <laughs> it's going to get real wibbly wobbly from uh, here. Yeah, did, they luck that? Us. Did, did they no, see I, that? Did they see that outright? Know. I, no, I, not that I've seen. I feel like that's a, a, a sort of conjecture that uh, has been jumping around. Yeah. Um, for, for, for the sake of Derek's question, kind of wondering if giants will get a new lore dump in a future book, if the Unearthed Arcana kind of hints at that. Um, and then spinning off from there, uh, another fun part of their question I thought was interesting was what other creature types uh, deserve a Fizzbands style book that's kind of centred uh, quite heavily on a specific type of creature. Sean, what do you feel the future of giants is? Um if you just had to speculate wildly and uh, with no regard. I, I would definitely buy. I would buy Giants. <laughs> you heard it from uh, Sean Merwin you, first. Well, is, is this thing on? Uh, no, I, I think that it would. I, I'm trying to balance out business-wise how much more Wizards can get in before the new version. And the, uh, the, the question that comes to my mind is, what else could they do now? Giants coming up in the Unearthed Arcana makes sense that maybe something giant themed would be out there. And I'm running through my mind of all the settings that they haven't done yet. There are giants a big part of those, and and I don't think so. Uh, I I think they could definitely do a giants book. I can't imagine that it would have the sort of gravitas that the dragons book did for reasons that we've already talked about. Uh, However, what could get a, a its own book and a type of monster that might deserve it would be Undead. Because while we have Van Richten's Guide, every edition of D&D has had the Draconomicon kind of book and the Necronomicon kind of book. And so that's a book that is sitting out there. There haven't been a lot of Undead featured player options. You know, we haven't seen a big run on Revenants or sort of those sorts of monsters, uh, which something like the Grim Hollow book does a great job of letting you play something turning into a lich, something turning into, a, you know, a ghoul, something turning into those sorts of things. So that that area officially is still open uh, from a wizard's point of view. So that's something I could see them moving in that direction. Giants, I have a feeling if we do get more giant material, it will probably be part of something else, not just the big book of giants. I did notice just on that quickly that in Mordenkainen's, Mordenkainen presents his monsters and they're all together, um, that the player options didn't feature the ones that were in um uh, Van Richten's. So there was no dump here. There was no Revenant, um, correct me if I'm wrong, in that book, which I thought was quite interesting because Wild Beyond the Witchlight, I'm pretty sure was after Van Richten's to my memory. I could be wrong about that. Please correct me at any time. So it's not like it was like, oh, well, Van Richten's was so recent, we don't want to reprint those because the Wild Beyond the Witchlight races were in Mordenkind and Presents. So you might be onto something there just in, you know, again, wild speculation, but just in terms of those uh, um, gothic um, races being left out of um, Mordenkainen's. Huh. That's really interesting. James, would you go for an undead book? Does that sound like something that would interest you? Oh, hell yeah. Undead are awesome. Uh, <laughs> they're not as awesome as dragons, but they're awesome. They're, you know, you get cool stuff when you put them together. Undead dragons are pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it feels like there are there are a lot of types of D&D monsters that, or, or monster types, I should say, that lend themselves to a really broad swath of different creatures. There are so many different types of 
uh, demons and fiends, for example, that you can create because they have that kind of lore that binds them all together. And, and yet, when it comes to undead, it feels like for all of the love they get, there's really only like three types of undead, right? There's the posh aristocrat, there's the specter, and there's the shambling ghoul with or without flesh, right? And it, everything's kind of a variation on those three. Uh, I, I'm open to, you know, a fourth or a fifth being added in there because I, I probably didn't think of it all, but it's remarkable how much mileage you can get out of just kind of riffing on those three types of undead. And despite it all, we love it. <laughs> we, we, we eat all that up, right? Uh, Grim Hollow is full of it, <laughs> full of different types of undead that are really just different kinds of skeletons. And like, that doesn't seem to be a problem. It's not a problem for me to write it. It's not a problem for other people to read it. This is great. And I'm sure, I'm sure wizards will, will, will be happy to get that kind of mileage out of undead again. Undead represent a fascination, obviously, with death and the, the sort of, um, you know, how people feel about death in general. Well, they um, represent a lot of things. Uh, true. Just, um, consumerism I, is in there. Just you know. Yeah, that's true. And and sort of monotony. Uh, you know, are we the real? Are we the real Walking Dead? Um, at the end of the day, I, I think you might have hit on something big. Undead have a huge cultural spread. A lot of different world cultures use the undead as you know as fable or metaphor for societal problems. Um, you know, just like all folkloric monsters are but undead crop up a lot because they're scary <laughs> they're particularly scary right ancient cultures feared two things beasts and the dead um uh and maybe maybe the vast variety of undead we see is is a testament to the many different types of stories you can tell with a very simple chassis this is a dead thing and it represents something that we don't like to think about mm. Well, I talked in a video recently about how like dragon law has really um, codified into this idea of a giant lizard with four legs um, that breeds mm. fire, right? Mm. Um, and, it, you know, vampire law to a large degree has done the same thing through Dracula where it's codified into a European gentleman with a widow's peak who, you know, swills blood in a, <laughs> in a, in a um, wine glass. But those codifications um, are only relatively modern. And I think that dragons in one respect or another kind of crop up throughout different mythologies as well. I drew a parallel between, I'd be interested to see if Dale like nods her head or shakes her head vigorously, um, uh, between the dragon and the chimera. Because in modern D&D, we kind of consider <laughs> the chimera. Yeah, good reaction. I was trying for my best Ben folds his arms <laughs> <laughs> impression. Well, the chimera, you know, like it's a it's an amalgam of different creatures, but it's also mm -hmm. a monster that ultimately breathes fire and yeah. its only weakness is when Bellerophon uses that hunk of lead to kind of choke it um, when its own fire melts uh, the, the lead, um, which reminds me of like uh, Fafnir only having a specific weakness as well, being that the underside of his belly needs to be pierced um, and he's, you know, basically immune everywhere else. And so the kind of... What defines a dragon that I came to was the idea of like this mythical monster that um, doesn't even necessarily breathe fire, but is something that is savage, nigh indestructible, um, and that this modern concept that like, well, if it's got two legs, it's a wyvern, and if it's got no wings, and it's a, is like crap. Like that's you know, it came from somewhere, but it's not a um, solid codification that is required. The point that I'm coming back around to is that undead haven't quite suffered that. They've, they, they haven't been coded into a single mm. thing because ghouls and spectres are quite distinct from each other and I think represent different Although people anxieties. have tried to codify zombies. Um, no, I, I think you're right. And um, the, the, the arm crossing was literally just um, <laughs> me, me pondering because the chimera is an interesting pick because it is not a dragon uh, as far as the mythology is concerned, but it is part dragon. So it's, uh, you know, people often go with part snake, mm. uh, but it, it, it was part dragon. And that's why it could breathe fire as well, which is interesting because dragons in Greek mythology do not typically breathe fire. Dragons in Greek mythology are often, you know, a big snake, for example. Sometimes they'll have legs, sometimes they won't. You know, we talk about python, uh, which, you know, has become the word for a really big snake. 
Python was the name of a dragon from Greek mythology. So um, you get a particularly um, bizarre spread of big, scary reptiles uh, who are dragons in Greek myth. Um, but we do have this sort of codification of the the European dragon, as it's kind of come to be called, which is, you know, a very Welsh uh, concept because even other British dragons don't all look the same. But that four-legged, winged beast that breathes fire is, you know, it's the Welsh flag. It's, it's, the, it's the white and the red dragon that uh, Merlin found fighting under the castle, right? Like, it's it's got this sort of basis in Arthurian legend, and it has become the thing. Um, and I think that people have tried to do that with zombies, like I was saying. But it even then, it's not set the same way that we are used to seeing. This this all pulls back to Tolkien's soup that I was talking about the other day as well. <laughs> um, you know, there are some ingredients that go in that are just stronger. Um, but you know, zombies, we try to talk about. Oh yeah, that they shuffle about, and if they bite you, you get infected. But is that like, if you think about codifying texts like uh, Night of the Living Dead, that wasn't about getting bitten. It was about being killed. Anyone who died came back to life. And that's how the zombies were happening. Um, and then you get stories where it becomes about the bite. And then you get stories where they can run. And all of those texts are incredibly, um, you know, central to our modern understanding of zombies. I, I was going to say earlier that it is interesting with the giants, <laughs> just to remember what the question was for a second. Um, with giants, it's interesting to have this kind of teaser that maybe we're getting giant content coming up when we know we've already got the giant adventure. Yeah. They're probably not doing another adventure story about giants. We, we can probably safely say that. Um, but it is interesting that we don't really have an official adventure that is kind of centered on... I was about to say centered on undead. We do have Strahd. <laughs> well, but, but That's true. again, vampires are yeah. kind of, they're kind of like a separate class. Right? Of it, it doesn't, what yeah. About, we've got um, the fancy, we've got the fancy Because they, they, they have this sort of, have... they have this sort of satanic undertone to them, right? Mm. The original Dracula, he wasn't so much undead. He was the undead. I think we get the word the undead from Dracula, but it, it wasn't like he was a reanimated corpse. It was like he made a deal with the devil and gained immortality through that mm. way. Yeah. So they, they do feel somewhat somewhat removed from our other zombies and ghosts. Yeah, whereas I'd love to see an adventure path that was about zombies. Give me a zombie apocalypse to play through. <laughs> it, it it feels less trite in 2022 than it did in 2012, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> Feels like we kind of got it out of our system and we're fresh again. Yeah, mm -hmm. with all the mythology talk that we've had, uh, I think it's important to sort of look at the business side of things, sadly, mm. yes, because good, what good. books sell the best, <laughs> the books that sell the best are the ones that have content that players can use to make their characters. And so if you look at what can we get from that, there is, like I said before, a lot of untapped potential for necromancy sorts of classes and spells and magic. And, you know, that, that sort of, turning spectral and doing ghost things and and playing with that and there's just a lot of still still a lot of content that we've seen before that has not been fifth editionized yet uh that makes me think that that no matter what we see it's got to be a little bit in that direction sean you've made me wonder we're Ooh, surely getting a vecna wonder? adventure soon aren't we <laughs> sure, and stranger one things. Come on. there was a big statue that came out we're pretty pretty certain he's going to be the big bad of the DD movie that warners is producing uh and Not it net. would fit in with you know a player's options reprint of necromancy and the undead it seems it seems like all roads are converging on Vecna uh, in you know the near future. Uh, you know, marketing wise, to be able to just put a book up on the shelf that says Vecna's Guide to Undead, and people yeah. who have no <laughs> idea what D and D is, but they walk past yeah. having watched Stranger Things, going, "Oh, I want that." It says Vecna on it, and yeah. you know that's that's marketing genius right there. 
Wild, the Critical Role is the one to kick this off, right? The Critical (laughs) Role used Vecna in 5th edition as their big bad first. Well, that interests me as to whether, like they've hinted at the Whispered one in Legend of Vox Machina, but they didn't uh, mention, and I can't remember their name off the top of my head, Pike's uh, Deity by name. Um, They became the the Everlight instead. And I know there's a Pathfinder kind of... Is that what you were going to say, Dale? It's kind of yes, because that because deity it's comes from Pathfinder. Intellectual property of a different company. <laughs> okay. okay well, and I mean, they didn't say Vecna in Critical Role. They said the no, Whisper exactly. One. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're they're dodging the IP that you know inspired them left and right. Yeah, but but I mean, good we'll, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the right move. It's the only move, really. Is there risk of like? Um, brand confusion with, I mean, I know it's all the same company, but like with um, uh, Stranger Things being so ubiquitous, a lot of people who don't know what a mind flayer is, but they know the mind flayer from Stranger Things. Or I think this is more so for the Demogorgon. When you say Demogorgon, uh, I I think even if you Google Demogorgon, I could be wrong. Maybe it depends on where you are in the world, but it brings up the Stranger Things Demogorgon more than it brings up the D&D monster Demogorgon. Um, Is there a, a risk of sort of confusion if they bring Vecna straight into the D&D movie. I haven't seen Stranger Things season four yet. I hear good things about it. I'm excited to. It seems like Vecna and Stranger Things is stylistically, at least aesthetically, at least much more in line with D&D's Vecna than Demogorgon was. This Vecna seems like a, you know, he's a humanoid. He's, you know, horrific and zombie-ish and undead looking as opposed to, you know, Demogorgon in D&D is this many tentacled, two-headed, gigantic ape, whereas Stranger Things is a flower-headed guy. Um, I kind of like the Stranger Things Demogorgon more, to be honest. (laughs) Uh, But I I think the possibility for brain confusion is a little lower, a little lower than than before. Also, it's uh, it's part of the grand fantasy tabletop RPG tradition to just take the name of a, a monster and just make it look <laughs> however the hell you want. Who cares about the mythology of kobolds? It's fine. We like the name. <laughs> we're taking it. You know what makes I, people feel a lot better about brand confusion? Lots of money. <laughs> That's fair. That's true as well. I'll uh, I will virtually put money on Vecna, Vecna not being the big bad of this D and D movie, but some line at the end of the movie that says like, you know, oh, they have defended the city well. To fight them is to court doom. And then Vecna like turns to the camera with one missing eye, and just kind of gives a a bit of a grin, fade to black. Yeah, basically just exactly Thanos at the end of the first <laughs> Avengers film. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. do it myself. But with yeah. a six-fingered hand, yeah. <laughs> he lifts up a stump. He's just like, ah, oh, damn. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- that Vecna statue that they came out with really does have an Infinity Gauntlet on, doesn't he? Got the gems on the knuckles, got the gem yeah. in the middle. I mean, it's it's hilarious how closely it resembles the Infinity Gauntlet. It's in the cultural consciousness now. They can't escape it. It's in the soup. I know. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Sean, what would you anticipate seeing in a hypothetical kind of like Necronomicon style book of the dead? Uh, Just new, uh, new races or ability to build your character as an undead character. Um, If they're going away from a strict, you know, race equals these abilities uh, do that. New spells, new, new subclasses everywhere. Undead monk, mm. undead druid. We could we could go on for days. It would not be hard <laughs> to imagine lots and lots of, of new player content. Uh, in fact, many people have already imagined it, as we've said before, and uh, and created it. So you know, it's 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 a ripe uh, field of zombies. That's a horrifying image, but now it's in my brain. <laughs> a uh, ripe field of zombies. It, it's in the soup. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Dale, is there a type of um, book, type of monster that you would like to see, even if you anticipate it would come along or not, that uh, kind of focuses on a specific creature type? See, now I've got undead on the brain. I do think that that is a good answer. Um, I, Call your I, doctor if you have undead on the brain. Because <laughs> I... I want to, uh, well, I mean, if you've got undead on the brain, you're a gunner. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if, I, I really like the concept of aberrations. 
I yes. I really, really do. But I frequently come up against being like, I don't want them to work like that. Like if I see a- an aberration within the monster manual, I'm always like, ah, I'll just redo it to be how I wish it was. Um, so I want to answer that I <laughs> want to see more aberration content, but I want to see it my way, <laughs> not the way that I suspect it would end up being. Oh, well, it's because aberrations lack that mythology in real life that we can't agree. So, you know, that's, that's exactly the point. And something yeah. like Beholders is something that we can get behind as a mythology among D and D players, not in the, mm. not in the, you know, larger world, but we, we can get behind the, but that's limited. That's very limited. Yeah. And how far can we go, you know, with just one book and what sort of player uh, content can we make with that? It's, it's yeah. tougher. And also, I mean, I will just say that the Beholders is exactly how I know that I'm like in the absolute minority when it comes to aberrations because I am not a fan of Beholders as they exist. I have my complete own rework of Beholders that I'm like, mm, yes, that is what I want from my aberrations. And that's only for me and the poor players who I inflicted upon. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that's in my head, that's what I would love to see more of. Speaking of Lucian from Critical Role, I mean, spoiler alert for the end of campaign two, but Matt made a beholder into a humanoid being that was covered in, you know, eldritch eyes from Very communing cool. with a, a city trapped in another plane uh, that was, you know, sort of becoming this psychic blob of uh, uh, of wrathful spirits. And so he, he went and, you know, made a Final Fantasy boss out of the concept of a beholder and the mechanics <laughs> of a beholder. And, uh, and a lot of people really loved it. Uh, so yeah, uh, everyone does aberrations their own way, even the iconic yeah. beholder. And you know what, you know what I think is at the center of it, right? I really like the design of the aberrant mind sorcerer, right? Because the sorcerer as a class has this kind of central conceit that it's like, you got your magic from somewhere. It was, it was some thing that was imbued within you. Right. And I think the aberrant mind sorcerer for me, more than any of the other subclasses really goes this is, you got it from some, like you, I don't know, you were near a beholder or something and now you're just weird. You, <laughs> you're just <laughs> Just one of those now. days, yeah. And walks, I really walks, like walks. that sort of, yeah, the, I like that idea of this otherworldly thing, this alien thing that just like is so different from from you and your world that it changes you on a, on a base level. Um, and so I, I like my aberrations to kind of spring from that kind of concept. Um, rather than just being, I don't like Zadatha. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> I, no, I, I think I'm with you, Dale, in that minority, although I don't know that that minority is quite as small as you're making it out to be. Because the while Sean's correct, there's not like centuries of mythology to draw upon. There is about a century of mythology and different authors writing in that um, mythos style um, where we get the idea, I think, of a lot of our modern conceptions of aberrant creatures. And the way that I like to use aberrations the way that I ran beholders once, uh, not beholders, sorry, um, mind flayers was I was running it like a gothic dark fantasy campaign. It was barely gothic. It was sort of more just, you know, like witcher-esque, like, you know, everything kind of sucks. It's muddy and it rains all the there's time. There's our witcher for today. And there's, uh, <laughs> yeah, and there's a, you know, there's a monster in the woods, but it was sort of, you know, this really, really low fantasy Uh, style game and the party went and started investigating this tower which had a bit of a reputation and as they get in there and they start pulling back the layers it's not like they walked in the front door and it was like bam mind flayer like the 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 architecture has like a face with tentacles coming up like it was a very slow reveal that these were the things that were were haunting this tower and in fact the first time i like they didn't see the monster. They didn't know what was going on. They had a couple of clues. They'd run into some sort of weird uh, encounters. And then an NPC that was slightly mad inside the tower said, oh, I don't know what these things are, but I've taken to calling them mind flayers. And half the party knew what a mind flayer was and half the party, as in the players, I should say, had no idea what a mind flayer was. And so there was like chef kiss like sense of doom at the table as half the players went oh no and half the players went what what is it what's going on and that's like 
that's the flavour that you want for aberrations of like fear but you don't even know what it is you're afraid of yet, you know? Um, and I agree. That's what, I, like, I would want to see a really dark fantasy. Um, gothic isn't the right word for it, but almost like gothic style aberration book where um, the more you see the monster, uh, the more horrified you become, but you shouldn't see it much. Is that where I'm going with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. As soon as you put like a a beholder mob boss or a mind flayer bartender, um, it just destroys all. Um, I'm with you and I feel bad and everyone else is free to enjoy that and I'm happy that you enjoy that. Enjoy your water deep. Enjoy it. But <laughs> I'm with um, ben. we're making a coalition. Speaking of aberrant creatures and children, um, <laughs> we got another question from John. Uh, John is in a situation where they are planning D&D campaigns for both adults and children at the table at the same time. Um, to quickly just skim through John's email again, um, I believe that they are uh, children of uh, some players at the table who took an interest in the game. They're not even teenagers yet. Um, and so John is looking for thoughts and or advice about preparing and running games for young players, especially in conjunction with um, uh, older players. Handball. Okay, here we go. Ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so first, first of all, as we proved before we started recording this show, sometimes adults can be much, much less mature than children. So what the general advice that you get for any sort of campaign is the same. Sit down with your players, figure out what they want through clues figure out what, if they can't tell you directly what they want, through clues by talking with them, figure out what they want, figure out what direction they want their characters, what the, what direction they want their campaign to go, what their attention span might be. <laughs> and based on that, you can tailor adventures to hit the important points along the way. So I think this this uh, email we got talked about one of the characters or one of the children playing a wolf, who uh, a humanoid who had been turned into a wolf. So if if that stat block that that the uh, player is using makes sense and is easy enough for the the child player to understand, perfect. Go for that. I have given adult players monster stat blocks that are very simple but to teach them basics of the game before we get into character creation. So, you know, that's that's a, a great move. Generally, be aware more than adult and child, unless you're talking about the the level, mature maturity level of the content, which is a whole different discussion. But just just be aware of, you know, the the level of understanding of your players. And work to meet that and maybe even exceed it a tiny bit, which is part of teaching the game and teaching, you know, how to play. Uh, but always and always be ready to adjust based on what you actually see once play starts. That's that's the this the simplest version of how I could how I could do that. I think um John's uh, situation where he gave uh, one of the children, yeah, a, a character stuck in direwolf form was actually very elegant and I quite like that um, because, it, as you said, Sean, doesn't overburden the, um, the, the child player too much. But I actually like what you said as well in terms of something else that I'm going to pull out of there and maybe use in future myself is teaching people the game, not with a character sheet, but with a, a stat block first, just so they get the idea of the basics of attack and, you know, D20 dice and, and all that sort of jazz first. Dale, have you played with many young people? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I'm useless. I'm useless in this regard. All I can think is that you'd want to... Um ideally maximize dice rolling because dice rolling is fun, right? Like I've, I've played a lot of board games with kids um, mm. and the, the like common thread in which games they like to play the most was like, they loved like King of Tokyo, right? Where you just get to roll a ton of dice, boom. And like scatter, 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 look at all the like stuff on the dice. What did I get? Oh, cool, right? Maximize dice rolling, but somehow at the same time, minimize maths. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's like, I don't know how you do that. But those two things do seem like a good idea for kids um, and mm. adults. Like if I was just now learning to play D&D, I think I would like both of those things also. <laughs> mm. Fair. The youngest I've played with recently is my 13 year old cousin. But I, you know, I, I've I've played with with very, very young cousins when they were very young. And in hindsight, I think what I could have done better when I was playing with them from a very when they were a very young age that I didn't have the wherewithal to employ when I was a teenager myself playing with them was uh Use use concepts that the kids are already familiar with, right? Uh, when when I DM, I draw from pop culture that I'm immersed in constantly. You know, uh, the the stuff that I consume influences the stuff that I create, uh, and that goes for DMs and players. You know, everyone will will take little bits from their favorite characters. And it will be processed through their own mind. And that's the sort of player character they'll make. Uh, little kids are going to do the exact same thing. If you know the kid loves, and I don't know what little kid shows are on right now. I don't know, Paw Patrol. <laughs> I don't there know. you go. Uh, they, they already did Bluey. something like that with, with the wolf character. <laughs> um, the, the DM just then has to, you know, work within the bounds of what is reasonable for the the kid to not just understand, but also have an affinity for. Mm. And if they want to learn, you know, learning is a sort of N plus one situation, right? You don't want to go, you know, just within the bounds of what they know. But you don't want to go so far outside the bounds of what they know that it is sort of, you know, paralyzing. You want to go just beyond what they know. J- expand their horizons just enough that it will still fit within their schema, their mental model of the world. Uh just a little bit more. And, mm. you know, that, that works for everything. It works for language. It works for math. It works for da 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 d d also. I went to a game store to run a fourth edition d d Encounters, uh, which was a program that fourth edition had every Wednesday night, game stores around the world. You could play for an hour, hour and a half. And I had been running it at this game store and we were having a great time. And then I wrote one season of d d Encounters and the adults at the game store were very, oh, my gosh, we're going to get to play with the author. And <laughs> a table of kids showed up the first day, week going, we want to play. <gasps> this was probably between the ages of 8 and 12, I would guess. And so I thought, well, we had a, two or three tables. And I said to the other DMs, I will take the kids table. And uh, so I did. And this was a very... To sort of dark, war-torn, you know, dramatic story. I didn't run anything that I had written the, uh, the whole time. It was completely, we made up, we did our own. We were sort of in the stream of the story, but it was totally different. Now, these these were children who you would definitely say these are children, right? Some of them Mm. hadn't really played as soon as they figured out they could do anything. They started hitting each other. They started hitting the (laughs) barn animals. They started. uh, There were several urination incidents uh, (laughs) in the game, not outside of the game. It it got a little hairy. So what we had to do was bring them in to boundaries. Yeah. And say, Mm. yes, your character can do anything. But there will be consequences for the things you do uh, because the, they were young, but they were used to video games where you could run around and kick cats and you know, do these things and nothing would happen. And so now we were like, OK, we're going to tell a story as a group. So how do we want this story to go? And and it takes patience. Uh but it takes patience with adults sometimes. So mm. all the game mastering tools that you have, they're still used. They just may be used a little more. And the real issue uh, that John talks about is you're running a session both for adults and children. And that's where this dichotomy is. The game is great, except when you have uneven players and that uneven nature could be uh, maturity. It could be play style, whatever. When you get that uneven level of what people want or how people want to play, 
that's when you are pushed to the edge as the DM because you're being pulled in several different directions. Sometimes it's a zero sum game in terms of what is fun for the players. So you have to be willing to split yourself in two and really hit this hard for the role players and then hit this hard for the right min maxers and then hit this hard for the, uh, you know, whatever play style you, that, that you're dealing with. You know what grownups and kids will both enjoy? Fighting a dragon because dragons are cool. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Ben, you ran for kids Full recently, circle. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I used to run for kids, not constantly, but definitely ran for kids a couple times. And and Sean was just causing me to have flashbacks to the few times that I did it where they turn on each other or, or whatever it happens to be. Um the advice, I mean, if you're running for kids exclusively, uh, I think, and like little kids, like ages 10 or 11 and below, um, I think you're right, Sean, in terms of, you know, have an adventure ready. If you want to have an adventure ready, don't expect them to play the adventure or at least be like super ready to be very flexible with it. Um, in terms of like problem, quote unquote, problem players, and what I mean by that um, in this specific circumstance is like players that, um, you know, want to muck around, want to harass NPCs, want to, you know, kick cats, want to do that sort of stuff, which kids can sometimes be want to do. The easiest solution for that I found is just throw them in a dungeon. Just be like, all right, you're in the dungeon now and you, let, let's go. Just like in real life. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because um, there's less cats and NPCs to harass in that circumstance. But at the same time, you know, um, don't expect them to go along with your plans and be flexible. I've, I've run games for kids twice where it was um, the Goblin Cave from Lost Minds of Fandelva was basically what I was going to run. And in neither circumstance did they even enter the cave. It was like, let's, you know, put on a show. We'll put on a theatre show to lure the goblins out or we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll convince Classic. them that we're goblins as well. And those are like sort of suggestions that it, when I'm playing with adults, when I'm playing D&D &D with my friends for myself, I might be, don't be ridiculous. They would never fall for that. You don't look like goblins. But when you're playing with kids, you're like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, of course, that, of course that's going to work. And then if you've got that mixed group, I think this isn't going to be the rule all the time, but I think uh, the one thing you have on your side is that if a kid sees a group of adults playing D&D &D and having fun, they're going to want to try to emulate the adults having fun in some capacity. That's not to say, mm. oh, just run the game like normal, it'll be fine. Um, you obviously want to tone down, like if you've got graphic descriptions of violence, you know, you might tone that down if you've got someone younger at the table um, uh, and, and have different kind of limits on what you might allow uh, to happen within the game. But they might be a bit more willing to kind of come on the adventure that the adults are going on um, and they can kind of, you know, pop in and, and um, you know, throwing them into a combat so that there's a very designated moment for the for the child to take an action and have a, a moment in spotlight is a, a, a good idea in terms of ensuring that everybody gets a turn. I think, I think that brings up a topic that uh, it's not just the GM that needs to accommodate the kids, it's the other players too. The other players need to be ready for complete session derailment, just in the way that the GM is too. And you can interpret that to be kind, kind of what you want it to mean. You know, be ready for complete session derailment might mean be prepared to go along with it. But it also might mean be prepared to, you know, also kind of parent the kid as well and and bring things back on track and kind of uh, adapt to, well, is, is this kid throwing a fit because they didn't get the complete session derailment they want? They didn't get to do what they want? Uh, what do you do in that scenario? And, you know, I'm... I'm not a parent <laughs> and and I don't feel equipped to answer that question. But hopefully if you know if you're the kind of person who is asking that question, you you have a parent in your life or you are a parent yourself and you can you can find some good parenting answers uh, to something like that. There was one session I remember, it was in a it was at a bar, so it was in a public space and um 
somebody had brought their their son along to play had heard there was a Dungeons and Dragons event going on and the kid sat at the table had obviously done a bit of reading beforehand with a big smile on his face and he said I have a Vorpal sword and I'm like uh, no you don't but uh let, let's see how the night goes and then you know every every uh you know oh what would you want to do in this situation was oh I find a Vorpal sword on the ground and cut his head off like this he was just obsessed with getting a Vorpal sword and so mm. the compromise we came to was eventually I said, oh, you see there's a chest in the corner of this room. And he goes over and opens the chest and I'm like, and there's a sword inside. And it was maybe a plus one weapon, you know, like it was not a, a vorpal sword, so to speak. But, you be- you know, what do you call this weapon? It's a vorpal sword. Perfect. It's a vorpal sword, you know, so you... You don't let them derail. You don't let them kind of uh, completely go off in their own direction. If you've got other adults at the table you need to accommodate for, but you give them something, you know, that kind of, if they're telling you what their fun is, I want a Vorpal Sword, I want to, you know, um, do X, Y, Z, you can kind of find that compromise. What can you give them in the session that makes them feel like their uh, participation is being rewarded, so to speak. Speaking of participation... Uh, we have participated in this podcast for long enough uh, for this week. <laughs> so uh, we will be back next week as every week. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, feel free to keep the conversation going over on Twitter. Our handles uh, are just below our names. Um, you can also leave a comment uh, or email us podcast at ghostfiregaming.com, much like Victoria, uh, John and Derek did. Uh, we love those emails. We love getting questions because it makes my job easy because I don't have to think of topics. So please send through your questions and we will answer them diligently. Otherwise, spread the word of the Eldritch Lawcast because we will be back next week as every week. I've been Ben Byrne here with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, Sean Merwin. Until next time. Yeah.